Good morning. For this morning's worship service, my name is Jerry Hill, and I'll be your worship uh, assistant this morning. Our announcements for today, uh, the flowers on the altar today are in memory of Winifred McKay. These flowers are available to be taken to a shut-in or someone you might know who could use a touch of color to brighten their day. To pick up the flowers, please see Mary Beth States. If, and if you wish to put flowers on the altar in, in honor or in memory of someone, please call Lynn Brown in the church office. And there will be a finance committee meeting on March 19th at 7 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. If you're unable to attend, please contact Bill Bryan. Uh, to order Easter plants, please use the form that's enclosed in your bulletin. The tulips and the lilies are available for $10 each. Orders must be in the church office by Sunday, March 24th, so next Sunday, along with your payment. Now the stewardship committee will be having a pancake, eggs, and sausage breakfast on Palm Sunday in Fellowship Hall from 10.30 to 12. Donations are $8 for adults and $4 for children under 12. Linda Rutledge will be in Fellowship Hall today if you wish to purchase advance tickets. The faded black or blue memorial book is still missing. This book lists gifts to our church made in memory of loved ones from 1952 to 2018, including such items as the pews, altar, memorial font, and other furnishings in our current sanctuary. So please stay on the lookout for this book. It's most likely in a very unlikely place, and thank you for your concern. And now please join, us, join me in our call to worship. We tell folks about God and pray. To scoffers we say, you will see, as we're warned in the Lord's prophecy. And now stand if you're able and join me in our first hymn found on page 438, Forth in thy name, O Lord, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please be seated. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we give you thanks that you haven't left us in the dark, wondering about what is the means by which you want to relate to you, or you want us to relate to you. You haven't left us guessing, you haven't left us to figure it out on our own by trial and error. You've told us exactly what works in getting along with you 
and you've also told us exactly what doesn't work in getting along with you. You've made it very clear to us that you want us to know you and to love you and to worship you and to obey you in everything that you have commanded us. You want us to trust you in all things. The fact that we can't see you now and the fact that we can't yet see the things that we are hoping for are all the more reasons that you want us to trust you for the outcome. You want us to trust you for our eternal destiny. You want us to trust you in that you have a plan for our lives that is designed to achieve what is best for us. You want us to trust you to provide for us. You want us to trust that you hear our prayers. You want us to trust you that you want to heal us and you can. Above it all, Father, you want us to trust in your son, Jesus. You want us to trust that he is precisely who he said he is. You want us to trust that he is coming back for us. So Lord, help us to be so filled with the truth about your son, Jesus. Help us to believe it so deeply that it overflows from us as we share our faith with those around us who do not yet know you. This morning, Lord, please hear the praises and the prayer requests of your people. In the midst of great upheaval in our nation and in our world, Father, we ask for your peace that passes all understanding. And in that peace, we ask you to use us as individuals and as a church to fix what's wrong with the world and to reconcile it to you and to make it into what you ori originally intended it to be. Please bring salvation to all of our police and firefighters and our EMTs. Bless and protect them and their families and we thank you for them, Lord. Please encourage those of our congregation who are living in nursing homes and retirement communities. Help them to continue to be of service to you here and now in your kingdom. Father, we want to be a congregation that makes your presence obvious to the community around us. Help us to be creative and resourceful and help us to be willing to sacrifice if that's what it takes. And so trusting that you hear us, and trusting that you have our best interests at heart. We pray as your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now our tithes and offerings will be brought forward to the Lord God. If you're able, please rise.
Dear Lord God, what does it cost for a single heartbeat? Could we ever earn it? Could we ever afford it? What does it cost, Lord, for the air that we breathe, for a single breath? Could we ever earn it? Could we ever afford it? Father, you bless us with so very, very much every single day. Bless us also with grateful hearts to praise you with. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please be seated. This morning's scripture reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. And if you'd like to follow along in your few Bibles, it's on page 868. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those of you who are of the, who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will always keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who ever comes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of God for the people of God. God. Well, good morning. So we are continuing onward through our look at the seven churches of Revelation. And today we are arriving at the Church of Philadelphia. You'll find that, of course, in Revelation chapter 3 at verse 7. In your pew Bibles, that's page 868, and it's also printed on the back page of your bulletin. And you might recall that we've said that these seven churches that God wrote to here in the book of Revelation um, that there, there's only two that God did not have some sort of a complaint about. There were, there were just two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, who we're going to um, look at today. And just, just because God didn't have a beef with the church in Philadelphia doesn't mean that there aren't some important things that we can learn from this portion of Scripture. Once more, we're going to see, uh, just as I've told you many times, that there are multiple layers of meaning, even in one passage of Scripture. They're complementary layers. They work together. They may not say the same thing at all, but they work together. And so we're going to get some good clues as to how those layers work as we look at this passage. Um, we learn how God will level the playing field. We've talked about that. Um, he's going to ultimately set things right that presently look very, very wrong. And we'll get a glimpse of what's ahead for the world. You know, Revelation does have prophecy in it, and so we're going to hit some of that today. So let's, let's dive in and let's see what we find. So from studying several of these letters to the churches so far, we know that the first part of all these letters is the introduction of the speaker, and the speaker is who? Yeah, it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who's doing the talking here. 
So we find the introduction in verse 7, and we've also learned that the introduction of each of these letters um, gives us some important information about Jesus. Each one of those letters, that information uh, has to do with what Jesus has to say to that church. And it's another piece of information for us about Jesus. So let's look at verse 7, page 868 in your pew Bible. Here's what it says. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Now, I don't know if you're reading that for the first time or if you've seen it before, but when you do read it for the first time, or maybe even now, you might be inclined to think, what's, what's all this talking about, you know? What's, what's with the key of David? What key? And, and, and why are we talking about David all of a sudden? What's with the opening and shutting and all that? And here's a perfect example of where, uh, if you only want to read the New Testament, you know, I only read the New Testament. I'm a New Testament Christian, you know. There's, there's a lot of Christians who say things like that. And you want to ignore the Old Testament, you're going to be totally in the dark about some of the things that you find in the New Testament, like this stuff. Oh, my goodness. You, you know, you're going to be without a clue. You won't have the slightest idea of what they're talking about. And so all you'll be able to do when you get to spots like that is to guess, and I guarantee you that if you're guessing, um, you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff about the New Testament wrong that way. Okay, so sure enough, the key to understanding verse 7, uh, to understanding what it's saying, is to look at the place that it came from. Well, it came from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. So um, let's do that. Uh, keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 3, please. And, and please turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 20. It's page 498 in your pew Bible, page 498, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 20, page 498. And... Uh, by looking at Isaiah, we're going to get some inkling as to what it's talking about here at the, at the end of the New Testament. So here's what it says um, in uh, Isaiah 22 uh, at verse 20, page 498. It says, In that day I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now watch verse 22. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. There it is. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. So you see it, there it is, right? You see that, that key to the house of David, right? You see that? Now back here in Isaiah, the key to the house of David is most likely referring to the storehouses, uh, to the riches of the king's family in Israel. That's, you know, they, the, the, the gold and, and whatever jewels they had and what have you. Um, they were kept in storehouses and there was a key to it. And so Isaiah here is telling us about a man named Eliakim, the, the son of Hilkiah, who is going to be promoted by God to power over a, a proud and wicked man named Shebna. And so Eliakim will receive the privilege of carrying the key to the king's storehouses. And he'll have the, 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 the authority to open those storehouses, and if he opens them, no one can close them. And when Eliakim closes them, no one can open them. 
okay? So now, back there in Revelation, on uh, page 868, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, where Jesus really said pretty much the same phrase, um, I have the key of David, you know, what I open, no one can close, what I close, no one, no one can open. And so Jesus is quoting that passage that we just looked at in Isaiah. It was written about 600 years before about a faithful guy named Eliakim, and Jesus now is applying that to himself. And what's interesting is that although Eliakim's a, a good and a faithful man, he's a good guy, there's no way back there in Isaiah that we're supposed to take Eliakim as a model or, you know, a symbol for Christ. You know, sometimes in the Old Testament, there's instances where we are supposed to take uh, a, a person as kind of a, a symbol for what Christ would be like and so forth. But we really don't get that here. As a matter of fact, later on in Isaiah, we're even told about Eliakim's downfall. And so that sure wouldn't apply to Jesus. Um, so the point here is that all through the Old Testament, there are events and there are things said that don't necessarily relate to Christ back there when they originally happened. But much later on, in the New Testament, Jesus or one of the apostles quoted them and, and reapplied them so that they now referred to Jesus himself. That incident back in Isaiah really didn't relate to Christ directly, but now Jesus was applying it to himself. And so we need to be aware that these events back in the Old Testament are there. They're kind of like seeded in there. They're to be clues. They're intentional clues. And, and, and they give us information about the Messiah who we know to be Jesus. So they're kind of tucked away like on a treasure hunt. So, so what that means then is that here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, when Jesus, the risen Christ, uses these words from Isaiah, he's talking about much, much more than simply the keys to the, the treasure storehouses of Israel. He's talking about a lot more than that. He's really talking about the keys to the kingdom of God. And he's saying that he holds the key to open the hearts of people. He alone has the key to eternal life and to heaven. Jesus is saying that when he opens the door to eternal life, there is no one, nothing, absolutely nothing that can shut it. But he's also saying that when someone lives their whole life refusing to repent of their sin, he has the key to shut the door and no one can open it. Okay. Now let's look at verses 8 and 9 there in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says there, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they're not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So Jesus is really telling the Philadelphians, he's saying, look, I've opened the door to eternal life for you folks. I know it's been hard for you, and, and you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of power, and, and I know that unbelievers have given you a real, real hard time. But don't be thinking that you'll always end up with the short straw. I don't care what it looks like. Don't be thinking that. Don't think that you'll always be the tail and never the head. 
Don't think that you're always going to end up in last place because when I come back, I'm settling the score. I'm going to set things right. I'm going to make things fair. And everyone is going to see that I have loved you all along. And that's pretty encouraging, isn't it? My goodness. In other words, no matter how hard life has been for you, and, and maybe it's been very, very hard, if you've been faithfully holding on to the Lord's hand through all this, maybe not necessarily cheerfully, but faithfully, okay, then you can count on the fact that the Lord knows who's who and what's what. That's a real big deal. And he will set things straight. And he will reward obedience. And he will make it clear to all that he has loved you all along. Doesn't matter what it's looked like. Bottom line is, the bad guys won't win in the end. That's what the Bible's saying. The bad guys will not win in the end, no matter how it looks right now. Jesus will make sure of that. Okay, now we come to verse 10 in Revelation chapter 3, which says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Now right here, that is an important word of prophecy. It's an important word for us. It was important back then when Jesus said it, and it's important right now. And the reason that it's so important is because it hasn't happened yet. But it will. What's more, this isn't, this isn't the first place that Jesus mentioned this, and, and it's not the only place either. So what I'd like to do now is to uh, read to you uh, where Jesus spoke about this time of trouble that is going to come upon the earth. And he spoke about it in a, a good bit of detail. Yeah, and I'm going to read it to you from Matthew chapter 24. And when I do read it to you, I'm going to use a modern version of the Bible uh, to do it called the message. Maybe some of you have heard of the message. And the message is not what you'd call a translation exactly, although it involved translating uh, the Greek and the Hebrew in order to write it, but uh, it's, it's a paraphrase. You know, when I read a passage to you and then I say, in other words. So when I say, in other words, what I then go ahead and do is I paraphrase it. I put it in modern English, the way we talk to each other. So. This, the message, is a whole book of taking the whole Bible and, and the whole thing is, a, and in other words, you know, it's in uh, conversational modern English. So if you want to follow along in your pew Bible, you can, and I would certainly encourage you to do that. But as you do follow along, be aware that what you see on the page is going to look different from what I'm reading to you because um, the, the man who wrote the message uh, used the Bible as the basis of what he was saying, but he's paraphrasing it, all right? So it's going to look different even though it's saying the same thing. So in your pew Bible, if you want to follow along, Matthew tw chapter 24 is on page 700. Page 700, Matthew chapter 24. And as I read it to you, <coughs> uh, be asking yourself, does this sound way far off or could this happen any day now? Ask yourself that as you listen. I kind of suspect that uh, it's as current as today's newspaper. So, okay, so listen to this now. We're starting Matthew chapter 24, uh, but I'm reading the paraphrase from the message. And so it says, Jesus then left the temple. As he walked away, his disciples pointed out how very impressive the temple architecture was. Jesus said, 
You're not impressed by all the sheer size, are you? The truth of the matter is that there's not a stone in that building that's not going to end up in a pile of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on Mount Olives, his disciples approached and asked him, tell us, when are these things going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming that the time's up? Jesus said, watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities, claiming, I am Christ, the Messiah. They will deceive a lot of people. When reports come in of wars and rumored wars, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history. This is no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler fight ruler over and over. Famines and earthquakes will occur in various places. This is nothing compared to what's coming. They're going to throw you to the wolves and kill you. Everyone hating you because of, you carry my name. And then, going from bad to worse, it'll be dog eat dog, everyone at each other's throat, everyone hating each other. In the confusion, lying preachers will come forward and deceive a lot of people. For many others, the overwhelming spread of evil will do them in. Nothing left of their love but a mound of ashes. Staying with it, that's what God requires. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry and you'll be saved. All during this time, the good news, the message of the kingdom, will be preached all over the world. A witness staked out in every country. And then the end will come. But be ready to run for it when you see the monster of desecration set up in the temple sanctuary. The prophet Daniel described this. If you've read Daniel, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're living in Judea at that time, run for the hills. If you're working in the yard, don't return to the house to get anything. If you're out in the field, don't go back and get your coat. Pregnant and nursing mothers will have it especially hard. Hope and pray this won't happen during the winter or on a Sabbath. This is going to be trouble on a scale beyond what the world has ever seen or will see again. If these days of trouble were left to run their course, nobody would make it. But on account of God's chosen people, the trouble will be cut short. If anyone tries to flag you down, calling out, here's the Messiah, or points, there he is, don't fall for it. Fake messiahs and lying preachers are going to pop up everywhere. Their impressive credentials and dazzling performances will pull the wool over the eyes of even those who ought to know better. But I've given you fair warning. So if they say, run to the country and see him arrive, or, or, or quick, get downtown, see him come. Don't give him the time of day. The arrival of the Son of Man isn't something that you go to see. He comes like swift lightning to you. Whenever you see crowds gathering, think of carrion vultures circling, moving in, hovering over a rotting carcass. You can be quite sure that it's not the living son of man pulling in those crowds. Following those hard times, the sun will fade out, the moon cloud over, stars will fall out of the sky and cosmic powers tremble. And then the arrival of the son of man, it'll fill the skies. No one will miss it. Unready people all over the world, outsiders to the splendor and power, will raise a huge lament as they watch the Son of Man blazing out of heaven. At that same moment, he'll dispatch his angels with a trumpet blast summons, pulling in God's chosen from the four winds, from pole to pole. Take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, 
the merest hint of green. You know summer's just around the corner. So it is with you. When you see all these things, you'll know he's at the door. Don't take this lightly. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for all of you. This age continues until all these things take place. Sky and earth will wear out, but my words won't wear out. Now, if anybody is saying to themselves, so what? At this point, let me say this. What I just read to you is not from the Old Testament, you know, some Old Testament prophet whose name you can't pronounce. No. It's what Jesus himself had to say. It's in Matthew. Jesus said it. And if you believe in him and trust what he said, then you have to believe that he knows what he's talking about, yeah? When he's telling us about his return, he's going to tell it right. And for many, many people, it's not going to be pretty. So the message for you and for me is that this Christianity stuff, this Christianity stuff is serious. It matters. It matters to you. Whether it feels like it matters or it doesn't feel like it matters, it matters. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We just know that he is coming back. And we also know that it's possible that it could be a long, long time from now. And we also know that it could be very, very soon. Now, for those who have a relationship with the, the Lord, it'll be a wonderful thing. And for those who don't, it'll be endlessly horrible. And as believers... We need to get busy now. We need to be reading God's word daily to hear what he's saying to us starting now. We need to be praying daily, talking to him starting now. We need to work toward tithing because he said so. Starting now. We need to be very much involved in doing acts of mercy and justice. Starting now. We need to be sharing our faith in Jesus Christ through our words with unbelievers. Starting now. You see, every day that goes by, is one day less to get your unsaved family and friends saved. Every day that goes by is one day closer to the time of his return. And we don't know when that day is. So we need to get busy. How busy are you? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we give you thanks that in your kindness and your goodness, you've allowed us to know what's ahead. And Lord, we're excited to think that you're coming back and the time will come when we get to see you face to face. But we also know, Lord, that you've given us a lot to do while we wait for your return. There have been times, Lord, that we haven't focused as much as we should on doing the work that you've given us to do. 
Please forgive us, dear God, for those times. Help us, Lord, to do much, much better going forward. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand now if you're able and join me in our last hymn found on page 562. Jesus, Lord, we look to thee. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. 